Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. You literally have it within the power of yourself to save lives. The governor implores every person in Louisiana to stay home and isolate. It's just safer to stay in. It's safer for anyone I might encounter to stay in. Coronavirus fears, one woman's journey. What we are trying to do by socially distancing is flatten the curve of this disease. But too many have failed to listen to that order, and for that, we could pay dearly. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. We welcome you to this broadcast tonight. The headline in today's Advocate newspaper is bad news for our state. It has the governor pleading for everyone to step up. If you will do what is within your power to slow the spread of this virus, to slow the spread of this disease, we won't need to surge as much or as fast. Now, the surge he's talking about is that even greater tidal wave of coronavirus cases we could see in the coming days. You're looking at the face some doctors are taking into the battle of surgery in the most serious of COVID-19 cases. A highly specialized procedure few docs do. But studies from China show those not wearing an N100 air purifying respirator, like you see here, meant the surgeons were almost certain to contract the virus, and not all of them survived. The study says the more typical N95 mask was ineffective in this particular procedure. It's just another frightening component of this virus that has turned the world upside down and has scientists scrambling searching for answers to combat it. As cases continue to soar in Louisiana, help is coming from Washington. President Trump has agreed to set up two federal field hospitals here and supply additional public health safety. But will it be enough? The logistical improvisations have become routine for Governor John Bell Edwards, and it seems most residents are doing what they can do to obey stay-at-home and social distancing orders. But way too many are not. I found this group near the LSU Lakes in Baton Rouge. Hey, you guys keeping your six feet apart, social distancing? <laughs> Seeing that is maddening for those who are following the rules. And you literally have it within the power of yourself to save lives. It could be your own. It might be your spouses, it could be your parents, it could be your next door neighbor, but you have it within your power, the opportunity to save lives if you will simply minimize the contact that you have with other people. The latest news briefing with the governor is still ahead with a little positive news shining through all this gloom. First though, some other stories we're looking at across Louisiana. A study from UL Lafayette delivers more sobering news about COVID-19. The number of confirmed cases of coronavirus in the state grew faster here in the first 14 days than anywhere else in the world. Economists at the university compiled the data. The governor ordered people to stay at home until at least April 12th in hopes of slowing the spread, but the spiking rate of increase continues. Mississippi Gulf Coast leaders are concerned about the number of Louisiana residents escaping to their communities as the coronavirus pandemic tightens its grip. A report from the Biloxi Sun-Herald says officials are especially worried about New Orleans residents self-quarantining along the coast because of how fast the virus is spreading in Louisiana, especially the Big Easy. 
Despite words from the White House that things are going well, hospitals throughout the country and in Louisiana say otherwise. Intensive care beds and ventilators are among the most critical needs for patients seriously stricken with the coronavirus, and the data shows our state and New Orleans in particular do not have what is needed to keep pace with the infection spread. The governor says the shortage of ventilators means by the first week of April, the state may not have any left to treat new patients. Saints quarterback Drew Brees and his wife Brittany announced a $5 million commitment to the state to, quote, help our communities get through this tough time. He says New Orleans faces a daunting task and is mobilizing his partnerships with Second Harvest Food Bank, Auctioner Health Systems, Walk-Ons, Jimmy John's, Small Sliders, and Waiter to prepare and deliver more than 10,000 meals per day throughout the state for as long as it takes for all those in need. Ag Commissioner Mike Strain answered questions about food safety and foodborne exposure to the coronavirus. No evidence exists of a connection to transmit the virus. He urges everyone to follow CDC guidelines for health, hygiene, cleaning, and disinfection. Check out a number of links from the LSU Ag Center. You can find them on our website, lpb.org. Mississippi River levels continue to drop, but there is still a threat of flooding this spring. In New Orleans, the river dropped below 15 feet at the Carrollton Gauge. The Army Corps of Engineers has revised its river inspections along levees from at least once a day to now twice a week. This week, the state got a major disaster declaration from Washington. We desperately need it. It means federal money will help pay some of the bills. Yeah, COVID-19 has now spread to almost all of our parishes with Metro New Orleans having the most casualties, but Baton Rouge and now Shreveport with sharp increases, a 17-year-old from New Orleans among the latest who perished. And scientists say it's looking more and more like that massive Mardi Gras celebration that ended on February 25th was a likely catalyst for the coronavirus in the Crescent City. As we said, we got a bit of positive news from the governor today. We are pleased to learn this morning that Congress has passed the $2.3 trillion relief bill. Uh, that will mean help for many people and businesses across the country and here in Louisiana. Uh, we anticipate that the president will sign that bill into law today. Uh, there will be major resources for hospitals, including funding for grants to cover unreimbursed health care expenses and increased access to digital health care delivery. There's going to be direct checks for families. In addition, there will be small business loans to cover daily operations including payroll and rent to keep the doors open, expanded unemployment benefits, uh, and training dollars for dislocated workers are included as well. Uh, we know that there's additional assistance for food banks and SNAP benefits to help our most vulnerable citizens. There also will be additional funding for child nutrition programs to make sure that our children still receive meals while they're not attending school. Uh, rest assured that all of our state agencies are combing through the bill um, to make sure that we identify every bit of funding and assistance, flexibility uh, that we can take advantage of. Uh, but let me just say we're very grateful uh, to our congressional delegation for the work that they did in helping to get this important bill passed. And President Trump today used the Defense Production Act to compel General Motors to produce ventilators to combat the coronavirus, this after days of his hesitating to use the powers of the law. She's an educator who could have been exposed doing her job, but after several days of being quarantined, she thought she was out of the woods. But as we learned through our FaceTime interview, Dr. Mary Hudson has a new concern about the test that was supposed to ease her mind. Since Sunday, March 15th, this is how Dr. Mary Hudson has spent most of her days, in her home, on her couch, under quarantine, with her dog Pippi at her side. The longtime educator sheltered in place even before Governor John Bell Edwards made it official. My job takes me to classrooms in New Orleans for the most part. And uh, I saw that one of the one of the sites that I visited had been closed down because one of their 
patrons or members had been um, positively identified as having coronavirus. And when I was at that site, two of the students were under quarantine for some reason. She says that new information gave her concern, but at the time, she didn't have any symptoms. I don't think I got it there, but it did kind of wake me up, and I knew that going into classrooms was going to be high risk because uh, children were not manifesting symptoms. And uh, so when that happened, I had a, a slight I had a just what I thought was an allergy cough, and I took Zyrtec for a couple of days. And then I developed um, a low-grade fever. And then Saturday night, I developed a headache, a really bad headache that I still had the next morning. A phone conversation with her daughter, a doctor, later that day, had her calling ahead, then driving straight to the emergency room. I didn't realize that headache was one of the symptoms at all, you know, and so I... I was surprised to hear that, but she was very insistent. And um, so I called ahead and I went in and they took me to the back and did a series of tests, chest x-ray and all of that. My flu tests were negative. Um, so, you know, and when you're in there, they treat you as if you have it, especially once those flu tests come back as negative. You know, we, I was in an isolation room and... They were putting on the gowns, and I had to wear a mask. Um, so they did. They sent the COVID nineteen test off, I guess, that day, and explained to me that I needed to be under isolation for fourteen days until, unless I got a negative result. Hudson says, as concerned as she is for herself, she's even more concerned for her daughter, who lives sixty miles away. I have a daughter in New Orleans which seems to be the hotbed or ground zero of this. Um, and she is, has been sheltering in place, and she's doing a really good job about it. She says she and her daughter share different views when it comes to the flow of information about this constantly evolving pandemic. She does not want to see any news from me or extra news besides on Instagram and all the things she already sees. She's overwhelmed with it and doesn't want to see any more. Um, I'm kind of the opposite. I kind of am a, am a news junkie to begin with. So I read, you know, as much as I can um, about the news every day anyway. And I've been trying to stay on top of this. And it is scary. She says the governor's decision to issue a stay-at-home order was a big relief. I have seen so many people and talked to so many people who have mild symptoms, but I also have now two friends who are in the hospital with pneumonia, one of them in ICU in isolation on a respirator. Hudson says she was also relieved to learn that her test for coronavirus came back negative, but... I got a call yesterday that I was negative, but was told because I was still running fever to stay inside anyway. So that's, you know, was one of my concerns and my daughter's concerned that I had a false negative. So um, I'm just staying inside anyway. She says she's talked to health experts who tell her there is concern in the medical community about testing for the virus coming back with the wrong results. So people could yeah. be sick even after taking the test and thinking that they're OK. Yes. And I am erring on the side of caution because of that. Um, uh, I, I spoke with one of my daughter's med, med school friends last night, and he kind of explained false negatives to me and said, there's always going to be a percentage of uh, false negatives on these kinds of tests. Um, and what the, what the ER doctor told me at the time, you know, over a week ago was that they were all concerned about that because they are not sure when there's enough virus built up in your system to test. So for now, Hudson will continue to stay put waiting to make sure she's okay. All of the symptoms were intermittent. So, you know, if I have fever, it may be later today. I had fever yesterday, and uh, but the headaches was gone, the cough is gone. So, you know, I just, it's, it's so weird not to know, but I feel like it's just safer to stay in. It's safer for anyone I might encounter to stay in. What advice do you uh, have for others who are going through something similar to this, like like you right now, kind of like in a kind of a gray area, sort of, kind of? Mm -hmm. Well, first, 
inside. You know, it, it's there are things to do. There's books to read, puzzles. You know, I've, I've had so many friends doing so many different things. Good news, I just got off the phone with Mary and she tells me she's been fever free for two days but will complete her 14 day quarantine just to be on the safe side. She said also tell your private doctor that you've been tested to make sure you get your test results, whether they're positive or negative. Sometimes you only get them if they're positive. Attending a weekly church service is a part of many of our rituals, but because of the coronavirus pandemic, life as we know it has changed. Services at churches throughout the state have been canceled until further notice. We talked to a local pastor about how you can stay connected spiritually despite these very uncertain times. This is still a good time to do church. Reverend Herman Kelly has spent more than 30 years in the pulpit. The longtime pastor's message of hope and faith had been a mainstay at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Baton Rouge for more than 21 years. Open the windows and get your blessing. In the spring, on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, many times we hear people say, open the windows let the house air out. Today, his message of finding light in a dark situation is about our new normal, social distancing, as the country battles the coronavirus. His message preached to empty pews and shared online. He says it's important that his flock and others know that our city and country will get to the other side of this crisis. I got up yesterday and I walked, and I spent time with God, because people depend on us as spiritual leaders, but I gotta also be connected to God. So I took my walk, I said, God, uh, speak to me. Well, what, what, what should I be doing? And uh, we had our dialogue, and, and uh, God said, um, you have to be a calming presence for people. You got to let people know that even though it's tough times, I'm still with them. He says Christians must hold on to their faith and know they are not alone despite our coronavirus imposed isolation. Church folk, we are social beings. We like to be around, we like to hug, we like to kiss, we like to shake hands, we like to embrace. Howard Thurman, one of my favorite theologians, he says there is an outward journey and an inward journey. The outward journey is when you go and help people, you go and relate to people. Right now we have to concentrate on our inward journey, which is the journey we have between ourselves and the holy. So uh, even though we are not face to face, we use our technology. I want to share with you why we are confined to our homes for safety. That's a good time for us to pray together. That's a good time for us to share with one another. That's a good time for us to reflect and pray and ask the Lord to give us direction. That's a good time for us to take the inward journey. I did a video last Sunday. I sent it out email and somebody helped me put it up. So I think what we have to do now, we give encouraging words, but all of us have to uh, deal with the isolation, but the isolation is not so much isolation, it's isolation from each other, but it's not isolation from God. And as we relate to God one-on-one, -on -one, then the spirit can spread out to relate to others. He says we need to help one another. We are all in this together. He says check on your neighbors, especially older residents. Like I said to my congregation, uh, anybody has have any concerns, they can call me because we can still talk. And I still have my landline which is for the older members, they gonna call me on the landline. I think uh, we have the technology, but I think what's gonna happen now, we're gonna have to get back to the old fashioned call on the phone, see how you're doing. I think that's what we might have to do. The pastor says something else is missing with canceled church and prayer services, the collection that keeps the church going. But he says he's not worried. We are going to take a financial hit. I'm hoping, as one of my colleagues has been saying, I'm hoping that people would step up to the plate, do online giving. If you don't have online giving, old fashioned, send snail mail. He says the bottom line is we must listen to our state and local leaders, put our trust in God and pray. The law gives us faith and reason. My faith tells me God will protect me. My reason tells me I should practice social distancing. I should uh, wash my hands. I should listen to what Governor Edwards says. I should listen to what Mayor Broom said. I should listen to what my bishop, Bishop McAllister says. He said to us, don't have church. I had a dilemma. 
I've been to church, I've been in church all my life. I've been passing over 35 years, almost half of my life. I had a dilemma. And my dilemma where a bishop says, who's my authority, he says, don't have church, but I trust God. But also in trusting God, I have to have reason. Now a bishop said, what if somebody gets sick and it happens because they were in church? So to answer your question, we have fearful times, but this is when our faith has to come to the top. Now, Pastor Kelly says in these times of uncertainty, if you need to talk to someone, call your pastor or spiritual leader. When the governor issued a statewide stay at home order that began at 5 p.m. this past Monday, LSU and its entire university system made the decision to close its doors, to close campus with very few exceptions. That's not something that has ever happened before, not to this degree anyway. The statement from interim president Tom Galligan was simple and to the point, and he joins us now to discuss all it takes to make that happen and to enforce it. Tom, thanks so much. You're at your home today. I, I, I am at my home. I am uh, socially distancing. Yes, and you I'm, are. The, that's <laughs> the thing to do. This was a big decision, but uh, you've said it was clearly the only decision to make. Yeah, it was absolutely the only decision to make. Um, and the decisions really started earlier than that. Uh, about a week before, a little more than a week before, we decided that we would go online for the rest of the spring semester. And it was after that that we realized that we needed to have work in place plans and we developed those plans. Um, the governor uh, issued his declaration and we really put those plans into effect. And uh, we asked our folks, told our folks, um, please stay at home unless you are essential to operations that are happening on the ground, like um, the re some of the residence hall folks, because we have some students still in residence halls, dining services, uh, our wonderful, wonderful facilities, and um, folks who clean the residence halls. Tom, the order from the governor, it, it's, it's interesting. It's sort of seen as the only thing that we can do to try to stem this uh, from what it could do at the worst, besides washing our hands, uh, social distancing is the answer. Yeah, social distancing is the answer. As the governor has explained incredibly well, what we are trying to do by socially distancing is flatten the curve of this disease. Um, we're trying to, to stop its spread and keep it from surging so that our healthcare system is overcome with ill people. So we're trying, as they say, that this is the phrase of 2020 is flatten the curve. How tough was that to shut down the Baton Rouge campus, Shreveport, uh, Eunice, Alexandria, the law school here and brief small med school and the med school in New Orleans? How tough was it to coordinate all that? It was a challenge, but we've got great leaders in place and I have a great team around me. And uh, the, the Baton Rouge emergency response folks, we've been meeting every day um, for uh, at least, it seems like the last month. Uh, we've been meeting by virtually meeting with the chancellors of the other members of the LSU family. Uh, we started once a week, we went to twice a week. Um, they put together plans and they implemented those plans. So um, it, it was tough because what we do is teach and what we do is learn yeah. and we do it we do it predominantly in person and now we're doing it in a different way. We're still teaching, we're still learning, <laughs> um, but 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 we're adapting. But for now, life has changed. I want to ask you something. Your thoughts uh, on a report from Liberty University in Virginia, which uh, had closed campus and then allowed uh, between one and 2,000 students, they say uh, mostly international students with no place to stay, they have allowed them to come back and stay in the dorms. Uh, your thoughts on that? It's catching some comments uh, this week. Yeah, and I, I haven't seen I haven't seen the comments. I've been mostly focused on what's going on at LSU. I do know that that many universities have students who have nowhere else to go, and so we're all trying to care for those students. 
Um, but we're also trying to be really cognizant of anybody not coming on campus who may have been exposed to this disease yeah. and, and would spread it to students who have to be on campus. Tom, I appreciate you being uh, here with us. Can we talk to you again at some point during this duration? And you'll, you'll be working from home, I understand. I, I will be working from home um, and and everybody who doesn't absolutely have to be on campus will be working from home. You can talk to me anytime. And we are getting very good at, at Zoom meetings, <laughs> Skype meetings, yeah. telephone meetings. All right. Tom Galligan, interim president from LSU. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you. And everybody stay safe. In his letter to LSU, he wrote in his closing, the well-being of the world is truly on your shoulders, but we carry it together. Even though we may be at home and staying six feet apart, we are together. The governor and members of his administration joined clergy and the medical community for a live broadcast from the LPB studio Monday night. Yeah, the program covered the state's medical response to the outbreak, unemployment assistance, education status, and curtailed services. Here's an excerpt. Certainly our recommendation is that if somebody uh, knows that they've been in close contact with somebody who has uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 or has, has been infected with the coronavirus, we do want the people that they've been uh, around uh, to be monitoring for symptoms, looking for fever, looking for shortness of breath, cough. Now sore throat's been added to that list because we're learning more about this virus over time. And if they develop those symptoms, the most important thing is to call out, uh, call the provider, call your primary care provider, explain um, what's going on, um, and, and certainly um, uh, get the advice on whether you need to be tested or not. In any respiratory illness, if you're asymptomatic, you probably shed less than a person who's actually had the infection. So that makes it safer. The other thing that we know about this novel coronavirus that is very different from its cousins like SARS is that you shed a lot at the beginning of the infection and then it tapers off fairly quickly. So there's a new study out of Germany that shows that by about day eight of your illness, you're really not infectious at all. We can find the virus there if we use highly scientific techniques like PCR to find parts of the virus, mm -hmm. but you're probably not infectious anymore. Well, the best place to go to apply for unemployment Benefits is online at www.laworks.net. Uh, we have a team working answering our call center from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., but you can go on and apply for benefits online 24 hours a day. In fact, I encourage people to try and apply during off hours. And the staff really does understand that this $247 is the lifeline for so many people. This is all the uh, benefits right now that uh, are readily accessible for individuals. I can speak to this as a mom with three boys at home doing distance learning now. So um, this is a stressful time and we know parents need support and help and educators need support and help. A lot of our citizens don't have um, access to the internet or computers and so we um, have created a, a section of our broadcast schedule from noon to five every day with middle school uh, and high school social studies and science content that we've been working on with the Department of Education very closely to develop and then we also have the the 24-7 uh, PBS Kids Channel, which is just award-winning um, educational content. You can't go back and change anything you didn't do yesterday, mm -hmm. but starting right now, starting yes. right now, conform your behavior to the executive order, do all the social distancing that you see on TV from the federal government, from state government. That's the only way that we have to, to flatten this curve. COVID-19, Louisiana's response will rebroadcast Sunday morning at 10. It's also online at lpb.org. That's our show, everyone. Remember, you can follow us on here and also online at lpb.org. Good night. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.